will ask uh, all participants of that session to turn on their cameras. So um, I call Ricardo Morgado, the, the chair of the session, the moderator, who is the chief commercial officer from ISCM Industries. So hi to everyone. Uh, so please, Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, good morning to all. I hope uh, you are all fine and healthy. It's very nice to see some of uh, known faces here. Uh, personally, uh, it's great uh, for me once again to be an active part of this event, uh, which is already a reference in the uh, offshore renewable world, I would say. And a special thanks as well to uh, Wayback and its fantastic team for uh, uh, this organization uh, during this pandemic time, which, which affects all, all of us. Uh, well, uh, I will be very quickly before I pass to the floor to the specialists that are here with, with me. Um, after this very interesting presentation of about ocean energy before. Uh, and with me today, um, I have a, a great virtual table uh, in front of all of us. I have uh, Jose Pinheiro from Ocean Wind. Uh, I have also Elisa Oberman from Marine Renewable Canada. Uh, I have Damien Lavagna from SVM Offshore. Uh, Alex uh, Raventus from X1 Wind. Uh, Amorina and Manuel from Wavec. Uh, and finally, David Tim from uh, Northland Power, uh, which uh, uh, I thank once again uh, all your availability. And before to uh, in, uh, better introduce the speakers and pass the floor, just to give some general notes about particularly the offshore wind, uh, which is the panel we are running now. Well, we are living uh, very challenging times right now, but I think there is no way to step back in the hard development and implementation of renewable energy projects and particularly uh, offshore wind, which is the, the panel here, uh, as as well the lead technology so far uh, and, uh, and the one that, that needs to be massive implemented over the next decades. Uh, both Portugal and Canada, uh, as already stated, uh, stated here today, have very big economic exclusivity zones in maritime space. Uh, and if we look to Europe uh, and for the targets that Europe has, uh, it's clear that they are huge. Uh, so up to 2030, uh, we need to have 70 gigas uh, on, of offshore wind uh, on top of the 20 that Europe currently has uh, around. And uh, in 2050, we need to achieve 300 gigawatts. So this means only in the next decade that Europe needs to install thousands of wind turbines in the ocean. Uh, and of course, it's a very big challenge, uh, which will boost the industry as well as increase the, 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 the independence of Europe uh, of energy and also decarbonize our economy. Uh, so um, uh, there are, uh, this is, these are impressive numbers uh, and offshore wind is uh, foreseen as the key industry to boost all this. On top of that, if you add the, all the topics around hydrogen and su sustainable production of hydrogen, offshore wind will even be stronger, uh, have a stronger role uh, on this. So uh, to end up, many projects are already in operation, many technologies, some of them will be presented here today, uh, um, are, uh, are being developed, many changes were already overcome, but many others, I believe, uh, to come, not only in fixed at bottom, but particularly on floating, which is, in, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the key technology for offshore wind in Portugal, but also, uh, and we will learn more for sure in, in Canada. So. Um, now I will pass and I will introduce the first speaker of this session, uh, José Pinheiro from Ocean Wind. José uh, started uh, working for the wind turbine supplier Vestas Wind in, back in 2007 and went through several functions in Spain, in Denmark and in Brazil. In 2011 he moved to EDPR uh, based in Madrid, uh, first as a technical uh, support engineering and then as a head of uh, operations and maintenance for EDPR's global operations. Uh, in 2013, he moved to Scotland and he supported development on what uh, we all know today as the Moray East offshore wind farm, uh, first as a head of wind turbines and sub substructures, and later as a project, project technical coordinator. In April 2017, he started leading the Wind Float Atlantic project in Portugal as a project director and also as managing director for Wind Plus, the company that was created to develop, construct, and operate the Wind Float Atlantic project. More recently, he joined uh, the new company created between EDPF and NG, uh, called Ocean Winds as a country manager for Iberia. Jose, 
the virtual stage is yours. I think, Jose, you are uh, without uh, no one is hearing you. Here, can you see, can you hear me now? I hope. Yes, perfect. I hope. Perfect. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, for for your, the introduction. Um, uh, a warm thank you to to Wayback for the kind invitation, and in specific to Professor Antonio uh, Sarmiento. Um, so the idea of, of these ten minutes, which I will need to rush through the slides, um, is to is to present you the the, the Windflow Adaptive Project, of course, uh, and the, the challenges that we had to overcome um, uh, due to the technology, but uh, could be seen across any kind of floating technology and also uh, the ones that still pose uh, uh, in front of us and that we need, we need to, to overcome. Um, th this is the, 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 main, the main goal of, the, of, the, of this session. Um, so, uh, but before going to the Windflow Atlantic project, we need to go a step before. Um, the first challenge indeed was to uh, to prove that the technology uh, in specific with flow technology uh, was a, a reliable one and a, a technology that could um, drive us through uh, the, the development that we want to achieve and, and this was in fact uh, um, um, being materialized by the windflow uh, prototype project which was successfully running for uh, almost five years from 2011 until 2016. Um, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this project was a, a, a two megawatt wind turbine installed uh, off the coast of Portugal, as many of you know, uh, and indeed paved the way to, to the wind float Atlantic. Um, the, the, Actually, short after uh, the deployment of this project, of the prototype, um, the, the consortium started uh, already working and developing the, the Windflow Atlantic one, uh, which basically uh, led to be uh, able to, to, in a unit basis, to, to, to multiply by four the capacity, so we could see that uh, the technology was able to take much bigger wind turbines uh, in the range of eight megawatt uh, uh, at that time, um, and of course incorporating all the lessons learned from the, the prototype, we were able to design a small project of three units um, with with a much bigger capacity. Um, a bit of uh, the the facts uh, of of the wind float Atlantic for the ones that are not that familiar with. Um, the, the project is located off the coast of Portugal, at the very north of Portugal, uh, at nearly 18 kilometers uh, from the coast, in an area where the water depth is already of 100 meters. Uh, so uh, a very good uh, place to show that the, the technology could work in a, in, a, in a deeper, what we consider already deep waters. Uh, not that much deep waters for oil and gas, uh, which ranges may, uh, are, are Quite higher, but uh, already already in a, in in deep waters. So this is a, a wind farm composed of three units, three floating platforms of technology wind float, with three wind turbines of 8.8 8, uh, 8.4 megawatt each. Um, so the interconnection it was not in the scope of us. It was actually constructed and is now operated by uh, the Portuguese TSO. Um, and all the financing, uh, uh, well, not only came through the WinPlus shareholders funds, uh, but uh, it, it had a strong institutional support behind the, 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 this project. We had the incentives coming from uh, the, the Environmental Fund of Portugal in an early stage of development. Um, and then uh, the, the solid part of the umbrella of, of uh, the NER 300 pro program from the European Commission. Um, we also uh, got a, a financing from from uh, from EIB. So uh, the project is a is a, a, a has a lifespan of 25 years, um, and uh, and we started the, the the fabrication of the floaters in this case in the Q1 of 2018, and we were able to to deploy the the farm throughout 19 and and, and 2020. 
Um, this slide is just to show you the the, the amount of of of, uh, of suppliers behind the project. We could not fit uh, every single one here, in fact. Um, but uh, it's a bit of a complicated one. But the aim is basically to show that indeed this was a, a multi-contract uh, approach uh, when talking about the contractual setup, and it also um, led that WinPlus had a strong role as an integrator having all these interfaces to, to manage. Um, so uh, the, the bankability uh, in this slide, it, it, I just want to, to point out that this was actually the big, uh, the big um, milestone that we wanted to prove uh, with the, with the pre-commercial project. Uh, so we, in that sense, uh, we were, and we are, think we are still the only project, floating project that has achieved uh, project finance. Um, and this was achieved when, when we closed the deal with the European Investment Bank back in October of 2018 with a, with a, with a 60 million, 60 million uh, project finance deal. Um, and now I would step into more practical and logistical uh, side of, of the project. Uh, this, this is to show you the, the magnitude uh, that we were talking about. So just very simply to, to just to locate the project site and the two main shipyards, uh, one here in Setubo, the manufacturing led by Asilo Match, and in the north in Ferrol in Spain, uh, the other one uh, built by uh, the consortium Navantia Winda. Um, these, uh, these two shipyards, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we, WinPlus and the, the project in itself has, has, has benefited from two different uh, manufacturing and assembly methodologies, um, very much driven by the nature where they were built. So uh, uh, in, in Lisnav, in Setubal, um, the assembly uh, took place uh, in a dry dock, um, as you can see here, the, the two units being assembled um, on pair. and um also uh, enabled transport to be taken differently as you can see in the in the picture in the right hand side of this slide the the, the floaters were taken out from from the the dry dock and transported in a, a by the use of normal uh, tug boats um which which uh, made their way up to the the installation harbor that we will see uh, in, the, in a couple of slides after um, here is the unit uh, constructed in in in, in Ferro. Um, uh, as you can see, it, this is basically uh, assembled in in the key side of, of their of their facilities, and uh, which therefore uh, and this one is a very nice picture that you can see the, the magnitude of 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 the platform in itself. Um, it, this enabled them, uh, as I was saying. Uh, the, the logistics to be completely different from the one seen before, uh, where we have used uh, a semi-sub vessel um, to transport the, the, this unit, uh, which could you can see uh, by use of balancing system was the platform was put to uh, uh, to float, and there uh, uh, was uh, at the key side were finally engaged. With the with the key side by use of, of this gangway. Um, by before starting the, all the, that logistic, we we we've planned the team planned a very detailed and cautiously uh, the the layout for the best best installation as possible, as you can see in this diagram. Uh, and and you can see a nice thing is that you can see in this in this following one exactly the materialization of that scheme. Of that schematic. Um, so all the wind turbine uh, equipment was uh, delivered from Denmark before, uh, and was put uh, as we have planned the layout for the optimization of all the logistics uh, needed. Um, well, uh, another set of pictures. Uh, this is just basically the installation of the wind turbine direction phase. Um, where the, the tower uh, uh, the towers were, were being uh, assembled and the nacelle and the and finally the the blades um, and uh, and and you here can see the 
uh, again doing the final the, fi the finalization of, of the job uh, the first unit being being ready here to be towed to the offshore side uh, and, and uh, while the other two were still here ready to be installed um, we have run uh, uh, into into winter and we had have had to come with more innovation on top of innovation um, we have had to 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 make our 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 uh, path and our way easier um, to stabilize the floater using this rock bed solution in, in Ferro um, because the weather was not simply uh, in favor of us at that time um, and this made it stable enough to make the installation of the wind turbine in actually in record time. Um, this is the last unit which was, was which benefited from, from this development that the team uh, has created. Um, finally um, because again we were uh, pushed to the winter, other uh, another setup of logistics was needed. We had to to come with this with this uh, nice uh, and very very uh, powerful uh, service operation vessel, um, which had equipped uh, a a motion gangway uh, uh, that uh, motion composited gangway, so we could achieve again another piece of innovation in, in never used in floating uh, offshore wind before. Uh, we were able, uh, in the, this, by usage of this of this equipment, to deploy people and, and technicians to 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 complete installation um, in a, in a safe manner up to almost three meters HS. Um, this is the last unit being towed. A nice picture from our our uh, service provider of the installation. And uh, the final product was, was this one, which everyone was very much looking forward to, to see. Um, the, the wind turbines, the, the, this farm is, is uh, connected to the grid since the very end of 2019. And throughout the, the, the first six months, we were able to, to start producing one by one until uh, July, where we have put the last unit to, in, into the grid. Um, from the O&M of our operation and maintenance side of things, uh, we have elected the port of, of Yenut Castel by natural reasons. It basically is, is, the, is the, the, the nearest port to the site where we built a brand new uh, facilities uh, where our team and, and our contractors of the service provision of O&M are based and we operate there from, from, uh, from uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it's a long-term commitment, definitely, with the with the with the port and with the communities where we were able to, again, uh, in the lifespan of 25 years, uh, to promote uh, and develop some of the local supply chain. Um, and and the last words are are just to summarize. And so we through this project of or two two projects, the prototype and and the and the wind float atlantic uh, we were able not only to show that technology works it, it is it is able to take in um, the most powerful wind turbines uh, that one can see in in the commercial basis um, through the wind float atlantic project we were able to show bankability so the technology is bankable and now uh, the, the 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 efforts that have been deployed by by the companies behind the project is to uh, drive the, the costs down so that this technology is more competitive within the entire panorama of of uh, of, uh, uh, of renewable uh, energy sources and that is basically it i hope that uh, you have enjoyed um and i'm i'm most almost certain that i uh, went through more than the 10, ten minutes ricardo uh, back to you thank you very much thank you Jose. yeah i was just uh two minutes ahead, so you are uh, almost perfect. Uh, I will oh, now uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will now uh, introduce Elisa Oberman, uh, who I ask to turn on the camera, please. Uh, hello, Elisa. So Elisa uh, joined uh, Marine Renewable Canada uh, back in 2012, uh, becoming executive director in 2015. In this role, she works to facilitate technology innovation in the sector by advocating for supportive policies, identifying international business development opportunities, and enhancing the capacity of the local supply chain. Elisa has also uh, designed and lead numerous engagements and outreach activities to grow knowledge and support for marine renewables energy development. Elisa, the uh, stage is yours. 
Thank you very much. I'm just switching over to my presentation. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I just wanna say thank you uh, to Wayback and also the Embassy of Canada to Portugal. Um, I'm very happy that I can participate in this today. Um, I think that's one of the interesting things about the times we're in right now is that uh, things that you know typically we might not be able to get involved in, it makes this much easier with this technology. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, just what the opportunity for offshore wind is in Canada. And I think probably people are quite aware that uh, Canada does not yet have an offshore wind industry. Uh, but there is increasing interest in the industry um, and, in, and growing it in Canada because there is quite a bit of opportunity and things in place to um, get to that point. So I'm going to talk mainly about two things today. Uh, one is just the, the case for offshore wind, um, what we already have in place, and then also some of the enabling activities uh, to support offshore wind in Canada. So just a bit about Marine Renewables Canada first. Um, for those of you that don't know too much about us, we're a national association for tidal, wave, uh, river current, and offshore wind energy. We have about 90 members. Um, and that's focused around, the membership is focused around technology and project developers, uh, utilities, supply chain, and, and research community. And I mean, essentially our mandate is to help advance uh, the sector in Canada and ensure that it does benefit and contribute um, to action on climate change, economic development, uh, and so on. So in terms of Canada's potential, um, it, you know, if you're familiar with Canada, we have the longest coastlines in the world. Um, and so with that also comes very strong wind energy resources, uh, and all of those to date are untapped. Uh, the other side of it is we also have a lot of experience in uh, other ocean and marine uh, industries. So there's decades of experience in offshore and oil and gas, uh, shipbuilding, marine fabrication, tidal energy more recently, and, and also ocean technology. So the supply chain is quite strong. Um, some of those companies have already been working in offshore wind projects uh, in other places in the world uh, and are increasingly getting interested in how they might be able to transfer experience from existing industries to the offshore wind industry. So I just wanted to provide a, a bit of a snapshot of what the wind resource looks like. And this is from the Global uh, Wind Atlas. Um, so you can see in Canada, we have very strong offshore wind resources. And there is some work to date. I just brought up another photo um, or image. There is some work to date right now to kind of dig down into that a little bit deeper and understand more about what that you know, the details of that wind resource on the Atlantic coast. So this is an incomplete map, but it just gives you an idea of what, um, you know, where the wind resource is the strongest on the east coast of Canada. I also thought I would just touch on the fact that uh, Canada already does have a lot of experience in the marine renewable sector uh, as a whole, and that includes wave energy, river current energy and tidal energy. So the map that you're seeing or the, the image just gives you an idea of where some of those projects um, are currently happening. And you heard from Sustainable Marine Energy and also DP uh, who are both active in, in Canada uh, with tidal energy. And that has obviously started to grow a supply chain um, experience around marine operations, environmental effects and research around that. Um, and so that would contribute to, you know, the future for offshore wind in Canada. And then I should also note that there is uh, interest from, you know, a number of developers also in developing offshore wind energy, and they've signaled that uh, in Canada. So there is some early work being done to, to potentially support that. I noted, this is just a slide, there's obviously no way you're gonna read through all of those uh, those those names and the, the companies, but it's just to give you an idea, this is just a snapshot of, of the companies that have been involved in tidal energy to date, uh, just in Nova Scotia on the Atlantic coast of Canada. And so a lot of these companies, this is just an example of how a lot of them have been involved in, um, a lot of them came from offshore oil and gas and have transferred that experience to tidal energy. And I would view it as exactly the same for offshore wind, uh, the same two kinds of things, and maybe even more transferable experience really. And so that's something Marine Renewables Canada is working on uh, you know, how do we support that supply chain when there isn't offshore wind yet in Canada? So we've been working a lot with trade missions and 
and identifying you know, potential opportunities for those companies. Uh, another aspect of the supply chain that I just thought I would highlight is the infrastructure and assets that are already existing in Canada. So what I really mean by that are ports. We have a lot of ports on the Atlantic coast, uh, also on, on the West coast. Um, but that's actually given us the opportunity to start getting involved in some offshore wind projects in the United States. Uh, so for example, this photo is um, was taken at the port of Halifax, which was used for the coastal Virginia offshore wind demonstration project, which is a site off of uh, Virginia and the United States. And so this we're seeing more interest actually from some of the, the projects in the United States where there's limitations around the Jones Act and some other legislation um, that makes some of our infrastructure in Canada already quite um, appealing and, and viable for their projects. So that's also starting to help get our local supply chain um, more involved and, and more experienced in offshore wind. So, <clears throat> One, I think, very important piece around, you know, the, the case for offshore wind and, you know, maybe also, or not maybe, but why we haven't really seen, um, you know, a big uh, flux of it in Canada yet. And a lot of that has to do with the electricity market and, and the way it's been developed in Canada. Um, so this, this slide gives you an idea of, of um, what that market looks like right now. And uh, a lot of the electricity system in Canada already uses very clean hydro uh, electricity. So the map on the right that shows the provincial electricity mix, the red part of that, uh, those circles is uh, hydro. So you can see, for example, Quebec, Newfoundland, British Columbia on the West Coast, those are already, um, they already have quite a, a bit of hydro in their system. So there is not as much demand for new renewables. Also, obviously some of them are landlocked. So there's, you know, it doesn't make as much sense for offshore wind. Um, but what you can see on the, on the East coast of Canada's provinces such as New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, um, there is more um, use of coal, which is the, the gray that you're seeing in those circles. And so that's where there's much more of a, a driver for more clean electricity. That combined with the fact that those provinces um, on the, the East Coast have that experience in offshore oil and gas also creates that economic development, industrial development uh, driver where there are transferable skills. And across Canada, um, there is a, you know, the major driver for bringing on more clean energy is stems from the Pan-Canadian framework for clean growth and climate change. So that sets a target of 30% reduction in GHGs compared to 2005 by 2030 and a phase out of traditional coal fired electricity by 2030. So again, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, where there is a, you know, a reliance on, on coal, that's where we're seeing more interest in you know, how could we take advantage of the, the offshore wind resource we have there. So to date, there, you know, it, it is very early days uh, for offshore wind, um, but at, at the same time, I am optimistic uh, that there will be a point where Canada gets involved. And I think we, you know, we, we are encouraged to see that there are some enabling initiatives underway um, to support that. So I thought I would just talk about a few of those. I mean, I think there's probably others, but these are some of the main ones that I had thought about um, when thinking about this today. So the first is uh, the Canadian Regulator Act was established and that that's a federal uh, federal legislation, and that includes leg a legislative framework for offshore renewables developed in the federal offshore. Um, so that's really important because it does set the framework for regulations and and uh, policies, directives, things like that to be developed. It's also a very important piece because currently um, there are like within Canada there are federal and provincial jurisdictional uh, issues around you know who regulates certain aspects, uh, whose responsibility is. So by setting that legislation, that starts to help begin uh, you know, fleshing that out and understanding what the potential roles will be. Um, but I think there still needs to be some work done in understanding the, the framework um, that developers, so that developers have some certainty there. Uh, as part of that um, Canadian Regulator Act, there has been an initiative just recently launched by Natural Resources Canada to develop offshore renewable energy regulations. Uh, so that little graphic on the side, that's the, the discussion paper. It's actually currently out if anybody's interested, um, but basically they are, they are trying to um, solicit feedback 
in how they will be developing their safety and environmental protection regulations uh, for exploration, construction, operation, um, and decommissioning activities. Also, uh, recently, I would say, I'm mean, trying to probably in the past two years or so, um, Offshore wind has also been included in the new Impact Assessment Act, which is also uh, federal legislation. And within those that legislation, there's a physical activities regulation. So essentially, that is uh, legislation regulations that help that that provide the the framework to trigger impact assessments. And before this, offshore wind is not included in that. Um, so we are seeing more attention given to offshore wind. And that also includes some studies and data gathering um, that various organizations are, are doing um, across, across Canada uh, to just help lay the, the, the groundwork for some of the things the industry would be looking for, and also pol for policymakers and decision makers um, in terms of you know where the best sites are, where there's infrastructure, where there's a need for potentially electricity upgrades, that kind of thing. And speaking of uh, electricity upgrades, the, the other encouraging thing that we're seeing is in Atlantic Canada, the provinces there are working with the federal government to develop an Atlantic Canada Clean Power Roadmap. And from that uh, has stemmed the uh, announcement of a, the Atlantic Loop. So the Atlantic Loop, it, I think it's early days, there's not lots of details out there yet, um, but the idea of it is it would strengthen electricity infrastructure to provide electricity interties between uh, the provinces in Atlantic Canada and the East Coast, which would allow for more um, transmission across uh, Canada of, of clean, well, across that region of, for clean energy resources. Um, I think the focus right now is mainly on hydro, but we see this as a, you know, an opportunity because it does provide some strengthened infrastructure that could also be have some potential for offshore wind and large projects like that. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of where we are uh, at the moment with offshore wind. And I think that when you, um, later on, you'll be hearing from David Tim with Northland Power. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what's really needed to support and attract industry uh, in developing uh, this resource in Canada. So I just want to thank you very much. I'm really happy to answer any questions um, when we get to that point uh, in the in the session. And this is also my contact information. Happy to talk more about uh, anything offshore wind or marine renewables in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elisa, for your very interesting presentation. I'm sure there will be uh, questions uh, to for for you at the end. I will now uh, jump to. Uh, SVM Offshore, uh, we have here today Damian Lavagne, he is project manager of SVM Offshore. Damian has 14 years of experience uh, working for SVM Offshore uh, in project management on some of the most innovative projects, including cryogenics, LNG offloading systems to the deepest mooring systems worldwide. He recently joined the SVM Floating Offshore Wind Development and is responsible for the project development of the next generation of uh, floating demonstrators uh, tailored for the uh, coming commercial uh, farms. He has a technical background in mechanics and industrialization at the Art at uh, Metier Paris Tech and a business background with a master in strategy and management of international business at uh, ESSEC. Uh, Damien here today will speak about the uh, SVM offshore wind floater and perspectives in Portugal. Damien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, can you confirm just that you can all see the presentation, please? Yes. So we are seeing also the, the next slide that you have on the right side. OK, I need to switch. OK, give me one second. Then. Is it better like this now? Yes, perfect. OK. Yeah. OK, so uh, well, thank you, Ricardo, for this introduction. And thank you also to Wayback for inviting uh, SBM Offshore. Uh, to this seminar and of, like we said and also to keep the pace in this uh, uh, under this uh, pandemic condition and I think it's key to continue and even accelerate the offshore wind business and discussion because uh, it's clear that energy transition cannot wait so I'm very glad to, to participate uh, in this event and discuss about SVM offshore wind floater and perspective in Portugal it's also the occasion for us to, to share uh, this presentation with Portugal representative and also with uh, Canada, uh, who is also uh, collaborating in this uh, event uh, this year. 
Um, so, talking about uh, SVM, um, we are providing a floating solution uh, for the offshore energy uh, industry uh, over the full life cycle uh, of the products. Uh, our main activities are related to uh, design, supply, installation, and operation uh, and life extension. Uh, we are uh, a market leader in the lease of floating production uh, system with uh, multiple units uh, currently uh, in operation. Uh, as you can see on this slide, we have a, a quite a wide range of uh, floating production solution from FPSO, turret and mooring system, but also lo looking at uh, gas solution. We also have uh, a number of in-house uh, critical and enabling uh, products such as swivel, chain connectors, uh, we are also operate, uh, an whole operating uh, department and installation also uh, uh, department in-house. And we come from Terminal and uh, continue to work on this with our Imodco branch. And the last but not least, uh, working on renewable energy. Uh, we are globally more than uh, 5,000 persons, uh, where uh, a bit more than 2,000 are uh, on the operations part of it. We are also recognized um, expert in mowing system, uh, in going into the most uh, arch and the deepest uh, location. And the deepest one is in Gulf of Mexico with uh, three kilometer uh, water depth. So it gives a bit of a feeling of where we go. Um, we have started on renewable almost 15 years ago, uh, and we are developing solution for floating wind and for wave energy conversion. So I think you can feel that uh, offshore is really our world on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we know by, uh, that it's also a world where uh, experience matter. Um, and we, we're gonna develop that a bit together. Uh, so I wanted to share with you also what does SBM offshore can bring to the, uh, uh, the wind industry. Um, well, first of all, uh, we, we have Provide, we have provided more than 50 floating production uh, system. That in itself means a, a vast variety of environment, of water depth, of regulatory regimes, and uh, all for this, on, again, on the full uh, pro uh, product life cycle. We have an extensive experience in EBCI execution, uh, most of the time on uh, some very fast track project. And we have a good reputation and records on delivering on time for this. Uh, we also uh, have a, a set of uh, a pouring, uh, proven mooring system design. Uh, and this lies uh, 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 also in some knowledge for hydrodynamic analysis, but also in some proven mooring component, for instance. Um, we have also uh, have a partnership with uh, IFPEN uh, in order to complement our, our hydro expertise with their aero expertise, because we all understand and uh, how important it is to have a strong coupled aero hydro uh, design capabilities uh, for, for the offshore wind. Um, we have been talking a lot about innovation, uh, and that's uh, exactly what we are in. We have been a pioneer uh, in the uh, offshore world. Uh, with uh, 60 years of uh, history of innovation. Always, because it's off offshore, you have to develop reliable and safe solution while still pushing the boundaries. So you really need to do it right first time. So like it was mentioned several times in previous, uh, there are some steps, there is, it's just a, a matter of also a global attitude on how to approach novelty offshore. We also have, uh, installation experience. We have our own uh, multi-purpose uh, vessel, but we also work on a wide range of installation uh, worldwide uh, and with a lot of experience on uh, encore or mooring line installation and also hookup. And finally, uh, we have um, uh, more than 320 years cumulative operative experience. We are currently running uh, a 14 FPSO, FSO, SEMI, MOPU, and offer our OIM services uh, to, to the industry. And uh, having said that, we, we have a, a, a true offshore culture, but also uh, HSE culture. We are currently uh, managing uh, asset integrity, but also managing operational and commercial performance. We, are, uh, we have to manage all the sustainability of our product. 
we have to develop uh, um, to ensure safety and reliability of, uh, of our operation, which are such units very complex, but also, and it's important also on the lifespan, making sure that maintenance and decommissioning is into the picture. Um, so with all that, um, this is all what we basically bring to the wind industry uh, through the, the, the concept which we have developed, which is based on tension leg uh, platform. Uh, we see the key benefit being to have limited footprint on the seabed in order to, to limit the disturbance on the seabed and also facilitate over activity. And we were mentioning earlier multiple activity and, and share the, the, the place with other technology or other activity. Uh, we also, through that concept, have some outstanding uh, motion performance. This will uh, reduce the, the stress and the acceleration on the wind turbine in order to optimize the usage of the uh, turbine power curve and to reduce the, the, the number of integrated uh, uh, design loop in the engineering part uh, of the EPCI. And also, importantly, is to make sure we don't need to adapt the turbine control strategy for floating because it's really very comparable, uh, comparable to a fixed application. Another aspect is that we have also checked the scalability of our design by uh, trying it on various environments, various water depth, and various size of a wind turbine. Um, and also, our design allows um, a modular approach for the supply chain, and we'll use standard mean for uh, local assembly uh, of, of the floater. And to finish for the, the installation, it will also allow the, the wet towing with the turbine using conventional anchor and installation method. So we believe that this as a whole give a cost effective design to reduce uh, LCOE in the commercial uh, future application. Uh, we are currently uh, executing this design uh, on the PGL project in France, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's offshore Marseille. It's a pilot farm with a three times eight megawatt uh, demonstration unit. It is for EDF uh, Energy Nouvelle with a Siemens uh, Gamesa turbine. Uh, and to be installed in 2022. It's a full-scale demonstration that will show the performance of this design and also help us in gaining uh, experience for the next uh, phases. And we strongly believe that these are some solid grounds for SBM uh, offshore future in the wind industry. And of course, like the whole industry, we are continuously looking at reducing costs in order to be at the target LCOE for the future of floating wind farm. We, um, we also have uh, another aspect which we are looking at is about wave energy uh, converter. Uh, and we have developed uh, a concept in uh, 2009 with a fully flexible structure uh, based on electroactive polymers, which has the benefit of converting directly the wave energy into electricity. Uh, it, it allows to be silence, minimal uh, environmental impact to be easily deployed and uh, also to reduce our maintenance. What we've done on that is we already have done small scale prototype. We have developed uh, a, a, scale, uh, a full automated uh, production line, which we are currently using to build a full scale prototype, which we will install uh, offshore uh, Monaco in uh, for one year test, and this will be in 2022. So for this product, uh, we, are, we are talking of a commercial readiness, uh, which is targeted more in the second half of the decade. And on all this, I think uh, you can see uh, all the expertise and the effort SVM Offshore is putting uh, in its uh, renewable product uh, of floating wind and wave energy converter. So that it's very clear that uh, Portugal is a good location to deploy uh, our floating renewable product with such a good wind, wave, and sun uh, resources. I mentioned sun because there, are, there could be some of using similar and moving expertise uh, over uh, type of application. And we also uh, know and have seen a very good infrastructure and, uh, and the local fabricator uh, very much engaged into it. We feel that there is really a good momentum and enthusiasm uh, uh, around uh, energy transition in Portugal and are willing to, to support it. So we are re really eager to, 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 to discuss with local uh, stakeholders 
since we are willing to, to further develop the site of uh, Viana do Castello uh, with uh, WaveX support and very much appreciated for that. And uh, also uh, a few words on, on Canada, of course, huh, which uh, we, uh, we know and appreciate because we have been working uh, uh, for many years uh, uh, with our oil and gas uh, experience. And we do know, and it was just confirmed before, that there is quite some resource, renewable resources that uh, uh, are out there. So we, of course, look forward to further discuss this. So uh, this really shows uh, how uh, what SBM can bring in developing these technology in these two countries uh, uh, in particular. To conclude, I would say that um, SBM offshore, it's, it's a kind of our vision. Huh? We, we believe that the ocean will provide uh, the world with a safe, sustainable and affordable energy for the generation to come. Uh, from today, oil and gas, which we are in, and we have built our experience, to tomorrow, the wind, the wave, the hydrogen, the fresh water, the off-grid application, uh, trying to decarbonize the, uh, also the existing industry. Uh, and we believe that SBM uh, offshore has a unique position to facilitate that energy transition, and we are willing to support all initiatives and countries uh, moving towards uh, that kind of uh, uh, transition. That was all for me, Ricardo. I, I can give you back the, and I thank you all for uh, your time and uh, look forward to some discussion after if you have any. Thank you very much, Tamia, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I, time is running. I know that everybody is thinking now about lunch, but we still have a few more very interesting presentations to move. I will now invite Alex Raventus from X1 Wind uh, to join to the, to the virtual stage. Uh, Alex has been working since 2007 in the offshore renewable energy sector, and he has worked for WaveVec as a head of economic department between 2009 and 2015, as, as well as for Blue Water in the Netherlands and Intergrid uh, before uh, co-funding X1 Wind in 2007 to bring a disruptive floating wind solution to the market. And uh, particularly today, Alex will talk more about the Pivo Boy uh, from uh, X1 Wind. Go ahead, Alex, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, it is a pleasure to be here again presenting um, uh, with Wayback. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my, I started into this sector uh, working for Wayback uh, from 2009 till 2015, pretty much on both wave, tidal and floating wind projects, so uh, before starting our own venture. And uh, therefore, uh, we have a very strong link with Wavec and, and other Portuguese partners. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, because I see myself in full screen. Um, let, me, let me just, okay, here we go. We are seeing your so, full um, screen. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so as you can see here, we're also developing a floating wind system uh, as, as the previous companies, SBM and, and, and the project from Eddie, uh, the Windfall Atlantic, have, have shown before. Um, so our case, as you will learn, we're, we're being a bit more disruptive. Uh, we, we believe that uh, in order to bring down the cost of floating wind, we need to think uh, in a more integrated way. And uh, as you will learn, of course, this introduces challenges, but uh, the, the, the potential cost reduction um, potentially is pretty, pretty attractive in order to, to demonstrate this. Um, just before getting into the technology, just a brief, a brief uh, introduction on, on our background. Um, the company was founded by Carlos Casanovas and myself. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. Myself, as Ricardo mentioned, from the offshore renewable, working on wave, tidal, and floating wind. Carlos' background is on, on wind turbine design, uh, having worked for Alstom Wind, for Siemens Gamesa before developing the concept. So he was, um, the, after leaving Alstom, he went to the MIT for two years, where he uh, did his masters on, on actual uh, TLP solutions as, as the one as SVM has shown before and there he learned about you know the potential of TLPs but also the challenges that they face and, and here's where he developed this um, concept which is as you will learn um, uh, merging the advantage of TLPs with the, the advantage of, of um, semi-submersibles that Windflow also has shown. Um, we, mo we met both of us working for Blue Water, um, also another Dutch leading um, supplier of, of mooring systems in the offshore sector. And it was really in 2017 when we decided to start this venture. We raised some investment 
and we've been uh, very successful in putting together uh, a very uh, highly skilled and experienced team uh, of people, of engineers coming from both the wind uh, sector uh, for companies like General Electric. One of our engineers has actually designed uh, the largest wind uh, turbine um, in the world, the, the Helia 12 megawatt, before joining our company, as well as Siemens Gamesa um, and Adwen. Uh, but also, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, very important, bring the offshore expertise and, and we have um, some of our team members having worked for Blue Water, for Rolls Royce Maritime in Norway, um, and as well as, as other areas like control, simulation, which are key in order to you know, be able to optimize and, and bring these products to the market. Um, so. Here you can see here on the left, of course, the fixed uh, foundations. Um, but on the right, I think it's quite a, pretty interesting to look at the actual concepts. So we've seen two of them uh, just in the previous presentation, or two types of them: the semi-submersibles and PLPs, which both of them we believe you know are the more interesting and the ones to, to look at. There's also the, the spar systems, uh, like the one developed by by um, Equinor, uh, the high wind concept, which is has been proven very successfully uh, in terms of operation, but we see some challenges in terms of weight reduction as well as in terms of, of, of water depth uh, to do the, the assembly. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, Carlos' uh, reasoning in order to develop our country was really how can we, you know, um, as we're floating, uh, perhaps we, we no longer need to use this tubular, uh, this, the long um, towers with a very heavy nacelle, which is, you know, being larger and larger, very high up. Which is introducing very strong bending moments on the tower base, which you know requires reinforcements on the tower, but also on the transition piece and the floater. Um, so he really liked the, the TLPs in the way that they they help reducing the amount of steel significantly, but there's also uh, important challenges for installation of those units. Um, until now, hopefully SBM will show in in two years the first. A full commercial uh, TLP um, installed for floating wind, uh, but as, as, as right now nobody has really installed it in floating wind uh, because of this, you know, these challenges. So the idea was really to com to combine the advantages of these two solutions uh, in a in a smarter way. So let, let me show you in this small animation how it works. Really, the idea here was, given that you're floating, uh, you no longer need need this tower uh, to allow the turbine to to orientate itself around it. So you can actually leave the whole platform to turn around a single point mooring uh, in the you know in the way in the same way of FPSOs does or, or, or boats that are moored to the ground. So we leave the, the, the wind do the work for us. Um, but the important thing here is that we can redesign the platform. So we have this tetrahedric structure which is transmitting loads in traction and compression instead of using uh, of having these strong bending moments which enable us a uh, steel reduction on the tower, but also uh, making the turbines larger. So we are proposing a downwind configuration because as you, as, as you, as I'm sure you know, we have blades which are spreading more than 100 meter length, each blade, and this provokes tower strike eventually. So you need a lot of pre-bending and coning angles um, of these turbines that we're removing and we can use longer blades. Also, a very fast, quick connection system that we're developing in order to be able to tow back to shore and, and installing, you know, using local vessels. And here you can see also the partners, you know, this is the people book project we're working, not only Exxon Wind, but with a um, number of partners that I will, I will describe on the next slides. But just again on the technology, so our focus here was really to think in a more integrated way so that we can reduce the amount of steel, so we have a lighter design, but very easy to install uh, in the same way that our platform is, is fully stable. It's, a, it's in fact a combination of, of a semi-submersible that can be assembled in the port and then towed like the wind float and connected uh, with this single point mooring system. Also reliable by using passive orientation systems instead of active systems. But more important of all, highly scalable. As I mentioned, so we have longer blades uh, and longer turbines higher up our system scales better, uh, you know, with this down configuration and without having this, uh, you know, um, bending moments on the tower base that we're removing. Again, this the people the project is aiming to show a path to reduce the LCOE drastically, both you know by developing the solution, but as well you know by, as it was mentioned before, making it bankable. So one of the things that we want to prove is really the performance under extreme conditions like. Windfall has successfully done in the past, as well as high wind Scotland, uh, so that we're able to deploy, you know, and reduce the cost of capital. And to do that, we're deploying, we're about to deploy our first pilot project 
at Procan test site in the Canary Islands with uh, the number of partners that, I, uh, that you can see here. So uh, we're leading this consortium, but we have the new R&D center from, from EDP. We have the MVGL to ensure that we follow the standards. Worley experience really on offshore is also providing a lot of insight in the design of, of both the, the floater and the mooring system. And then we have uh, leading research centers in the sector like DTU, Wavec, or Procan, as well as some of the suppliers like the HEMA and ESM, which is the leading uh, supplier of, of elastic coupling for the offshore turbine sector, as well as collaboration with companies like ABB or, or Vestas. So, as, uh, I don't know if, well, if you check our website, the design has actually evolved quite a lot. Initially, we, want, we were proposing a truss uh, design uh, because it, it's lighter weight, but also we learned you know, that there's some some situations where trusses, especially when you have torsional loads, uh, do not perform so well, and they are more expensive to manufacture. So we've evolved this and, and we've moved towards a, a design which is uh, using um, conventional tubes, uh, which is uh, can be mass manufactured and the euros per, per kilo fabricated and reduced, even though the, the, the weight will increase slightly. Um, we've done our really our score score uh, core skills are on simulation. Both uh, coupled hydro and aerodynamic this is something that we do in house and we want to keep doing in house. We're using Orcaflex as, as well as bladed um, at the moment to prove um, you know and optimize our design. We've also done very complex CFD simulations with the um, research centers like Frank Hofer in order to optimize the design of the mass so that we reduce the the, the, the wake effects behind the towers. And which is now, as you can see here, fabricating our first prototype which will be a one-third scale, uh, but fully operational. So we have Vestas V29 turbine converter, full converter from ABB. Uh, we have an uh, electric cable from Heng Tong, um, and it will be connected to Procan test side in order to prove you know, the, both the survivability of the system, reliability, and the performance on the turbine in the down configuration. So another thing pretty interesting is, is so we're actually using an upwind turbine, a Vestas V29, that we bought from Vestas, and we have converted ourselves to a down configuration to show how easy it is actually to adapt these, these turbines uh, and the benefits that this will bring uh, when you're moving into very large scale, uh, you know, 15 plus uh, megawatts. So yeah, here's, uh, you have our details. If you, you want to know more about the project, we're happy, you know, to, to follow on with email. Uh, please drop us an email and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for your presentation. Uh, I will now uh, ask um, a Marina uh, and Manuel from Wavec. Uh, they will both present us the T-Wing project, the umbilical design tool. Um, a Marina is uh, is a licenciated is has a license uh, licensi licensi degree in marine science, uh, specialized in oceanography, uh, by the University of Cadiz in Spain. Uh, business development in the renewable energy projects and also has been made the research in marine renewable energy projects. Uh, Manuel is a research engineer at Wavex since 2018. Uh, he holds a MSc in ship technology and ocean engineering from the University of Rostock in Germany uh, and is mainly working on hydrodynamic simulations of floating renewable energy devices and aquaculture systems using CFDs and Oracle Flex. His specialization are cable dynamics, mirrorings, and automation. And I will ask both of you, Amorin and Manuel, to tell us a little bit more about the Twin project. Hello. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, uh, okay. maybe you can put it in full screen. We are seeing on the left side your slides as well. Okay, now it's good. Okay. I'll be giving a very brief description of the TWIN project. TWIN is a European funded project within Horizon and uh, Horizon 2020 and the twinning program. Can you see the screen or? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Twinning projects bring together expertise from European member states and beneficiary countries with the aim of achieving concrete results through peer-to-peer -peer activities. In this case, the consortium is formed by Wavex, as representative of the widening country, or Catapult from the UK. Okay. 
uh, or Catapult from the UK, Tignalia from Spain, and the University of Tudelt from the Netherlands. Our aim is to promote offshore wind in Portugal by means of enhancing our expertise in the field. The main target groups are, I'm sorry, we're having difficulties with the presentation. Give me one second, please. Yeah. Okay. It's not, I'm oh, sorry, it's not working. It's not, I'm sorry. Uh, so the main target groups are senior staff, early stage researchers, stakeholders, and I will be focusing on this uh, on the latter, uh, because it's where most of you will be able to participate on the activities. Uh, due to the travel restric restrictions of the COVID, our workshops have been adopted, uh, adapted to an online format. Our first webinar uh, was uh, in last September, and we covered different funding opportunities, such as the Green Link calls. You can find the recordings and other materials in the website of the project. We're currently preparing uh, further workshops and uh, webinars for the next couple of years. Within the stakeholder engagement activities, we prepared the supply chain matrix for offshore wind in Portugal. We received many responses, most of them from local companies, followed by Spain and the UK. There is a clear interest in further developing the offshore wind sector in Portugal. Some of the services we included were development and consent, infrastructure, installation and commissioning, operation and maintenance, and professional services. These are just a few examples of some of the services we included in the supply chain matrix. I encourage you to visit our website and uh, check the full supply chain. I'm, working, I'm currently working on the second edition of the matrix and there's still time to participate. We'll be updating the matrix uh, periodically during the lifetime of the project. You can find further information on the project uh, on our website. You can find the deliverables. Most of them are public. You can find information on the webinars and workshops that we're organizing, as well as the supply chain matrix and news and events related to the sector. Please don't hesitate to contact us if you're looking for more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amorine. Uh, I will now ask Manuel to uh, join to the stage. And Manuel will uh, present us the umbilical design tool, which he's been working on. Now we are seeing you, Manuel. Yeah. Okay, now the presentation is being set up. Just need to launch the presentation. One second.
So I hope now you can see video and sound uh, from my side. I think it's not the correct screen. Can you please switch the presentation? But anyway, I will start. So my name is Manuel um, and I would like to talk to, to you today about the dynamic table research that uh, we have been developing here at WaveX since five years. And why do we think this is an important subject? We will see on the next slide. Or not, we see a blue screen. Okay, so here on the slide. Um, so experience from fixed offshore wind farms has shown that inter array cables are quite sensible. Um, so even though they represent only 10% of the initial cost of a wind farm, more than half of the insurance claims and even 75% of the claim value are related to those cables. Root causes being the design and manufacturing faults or errors during installation process. So you can imagine if static cables are so sensible, then dynamic cables will be even a bigger challenge because they are permanently moving due to platform motion, due to wave excitation, due to currents. And another challenge that is coming to us offshore wind is uh, floating offshore wind is still in a very early commercial stage so we have very limited field experience and uh, also limited research experience but recently i have the uh, impression that the uh, research is uh, gaining momentum and wavec is at the forefront of this development Excellent. okay so what wavec has to offer we have developed a tool that is supposed to optimize the dynamic behavior of your cable, reduce the risk of mechanical failures and power loss, and thereby increase your project reliability and ultimately your profit. Okay, before I show you an example how the tool would work like, you have to know that cables can fail in uh, various ways. Um, but unless you have a hungry shark, like you can see at the bottom right of the picture, um, you can control those failure modes. And in WAVEC, our research, one click please. Uh, in WAVEC, our research has been focused so far on this uh, top four mechanical failure modes, which are tension, uh, compression, overbending, and fatigue. Exact. So, um, now, as promised, a quick example how our tool works. It is based on a self-programmed optimization algorithm that is actually optimizing the number and the location of the buoyancy elements that are supporting your cable and it is giving them a such nice wavy shape. The algorithm is fully automated. Once you start it, it's going over various iterations and it can deal with multiple design objectives at, its, at a time. And that is what we see at the right side, where you can see that we have four parameters. No, one back piece. One slide back piece. Back. Back. Yes, this one. Uh, so we have four parameters um, that where the algorithm tries to find during the iterations the best compromise between those design variables. And on the left side, at the same time, you can see how the uh, corresponding umbilical shape looks like. So we are starting with the initial solution that has a higher position of the wave, the orange curve, and it is slowly converging down to the blue solution. Now the next slide, please. Okay, and this tool has been working so well now that we already could convince a commercial client for whom we de actually designed a dynamic cable layout for a floating offshore wind turbine in the South China Sea. But our imagination doesn't stop there. Like 
apart from being a design tool, we can imagine this tool being implemented as a monitoring tool. So to say you have a life uh, fatigue assessment or you could use it as an afterlife assessment. Um, for example, if you would want to reuse your cable for another project or resell your cable. And if any of those three options uh, are interesting for you, then uh, feel free to, uh, to check our publications. There will be two papers linked in the presentations uploaded thereafter, or just contact us directly uh, and I will give you more technical information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much, Amorina, for your very interesting presentations. Uh, lastly, I will ask David Tim uh, to uh, join us uh, to the virtual stage. Uh, David is uh, the Global Head of Public Affairs and Government Relations from Northland Power, uh, from Canada. Uh, he's bringing more than 20 years of experience in the renewable energy sector, and he supports Northland's uh, business development strategy and operations teams in various markets around the globe in understanding and responding to policy, legislative and regulatory design and implementation that impacts uh, Northland's power uh, business to ensure to the continued growth of, uh, uh, of its business itself. Uh, David will speak to us uh, today more focus on the Canadian expertise in the global offshore wind market. David, please go ahead. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, uh, if you can put it on the full screen, otherwise we see your next slide on the left side. Is that better? Yes, now it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity this morning and uh, um, I look forward to uh, telling you a bit about what's happening with, with Northland Power and, and uh, expanding upon what Elisa was was uh, presenting earlier with respect to what's happening in Canada. So quick kind of obligatory uh, background slide, Northland Power is a Canada-based uh, developer, owner, operator of, of clean infrastructure projects. Um, we have a large presence uh, across um, four continents. Um, got our start in, uh, in Canada um, about 30 years ago. Uh, we were an early, one of the uh, earliest and, and, and now largest uh, independent power producers in Canada. Um, we were an early entrant into renewables here. Um, we were one of the first um, entrants into the, the offshore space in uh, Canadian, one of the first Canadian entrants into the offshore space in, uh, in Europe. And we have a growing presence both in, in Europe and Asia with respect to, to offshore wind. Um, publicly listed here in Canada, but we have offices around the world from uh, Latin America, the US, uh, Europe, and uh, in, in many places in, in, in Asia. As Elisa said earlier, you know, the, the offshore wind has had a, a slow start in, in, in Canada, and, and, uh, uh, but there's a long history of uh, independent power production, renewable production here in, 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 uh, in Canada. And what this slide, I mean, you know, a lot of information, this might seem like a bit of a, uh, a, a bragging slide, but Northland really had three, has had three kind of phases in its 30 year history. Early, you know, our early growth where we were getting up to speed, um, breaking down some barriers uh, in terms of the, the utility model um, and, 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 and squeaking out a space for, for IPPs in, in the country. Um, during the you know through the the late 1990s early 2000s it was our our, our our kind of goal was to reach one of the coasts in canada and national expansion increasing our our, our investments into renewables here really building up a, a a war chest of experience um and background and expertise in in developing complex projects working through complex policy um, uh, barriers and, and, and pushing forward to, you know, successful completion of projects. 
that allowed us to translate very easily into the offshore space in Europe, which we jumped into in, in uh, 2013 with our first investment into the Gemini Offshore Wind Project in the Netherlands. That we, we got into that project very late, but um, it, it was largely our project finance experience, a lot of the, that background through our early growth uh, here in Canada that allowed us to very easily transition into that. And that's allowed us then to get into projects much, much earlier, whereas in, in Asia Pacific today, we're um, you know, getting into very early stage projects. So we were able to leverage that experience that we had in Canada into in, into the to the offshore space where today we are one of the largest um, offshore wind operators in the North Sea uh, with a growing development portfolio in in, in Europe um, and and a, and, a, and a pretty significant presence in in, in Asia Pacific. We we have about 20% of the contracted capacity uh, offshore wind capacity in Taiwan today um, and earlier stage projects in both Korea and and uh, and Japan. What we really are, are, I mean, as a Canadian company, um, uh, you know, proudly Canadian company, we, we, we really are uh, um, interested in bringing some of that international experience back to Canada, looking at how we can repatriate some of that ex expertise and experience and capital that we've generated uh, um, internationally and help to uh, push forward some of the things that Elisa was talking about earlier around the, you know, um, developing talent, uh, pushing, you know, helping to reduce the, the learning curve here in Canada and, uh, and help governments um, here in, in the country achieve some of their, their, their broader policy goals around climate change, uh, clean, en clean energy uh, infrastructure and, and, and whatnot. We have a lot of work to do here. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that on my, on my next slide. But uh, I mean, we're, we're setting up our, our uh, uh, that, that global talent in, in, a, in a, something we call our, our, our virtual uh, offshore wind uh, center of excellence. So these are these are pockets in, uh, of uh, you know, offices and individuals around the world that have that technical, uh, financial, um, and, and commercial experience um, in terms of, of, of advancing the sector, pushing projects through the completion, and then operating them very successfully over their over their lifetime. And so we want to uh, say um, help kind of push push the envelope here in, in in Canada. What are some of the key drivers? I mean, Lisa talked a lot about kind of the resource potential here and some of the challenges that we faced. Um, you know, a big one, you know, that, that uh, investors like ourselves and, and other investors look for are really stable policies and predictable regulatory regimes. Um, we have that for, for uh, onshore renewables, for, uh, on, you know, other, other infrastructure here in the country. We're at a very early stage with respect to offshore policy. And so the, the federal government is working through its, uh, you know, its, its uh, look into what's needed. From a you know what from seabed leasing to permitting and approvals, um, you know how you how you push the push the social license and, and get buy-in from whether it's indigenous communities or uh, you know coastal communities where 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 some of these are running to shore, um, and 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 that will I mean that predictable policy environment allows investors and uh, you know from from you know developers to supply chain and others to to uh, understand what the what the what what the opportunity looks like and to plan their investments much more um, much more efficiently that allows you know uh, the best technology to come into the market the best innovation to come into the market the other challenge and as Lisa said is the market for power um, you know, where we, you know, um, largely, I mean, a, a big, you know, a significant chunk of our electricity mix in, in the country is, is hydro is already clean. I think, you know, our, the emissions from our electricity sector are, uh, very low and, 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 and declining, uh, rapidly based on government policy and just industry drivers. Um, I think we have to get smarter around what we do on our coasts. Um, you know, the, and 
um, and, and break down some of the barriers and some of the kind of historic thinking around what, um, what we're doing. So um, rather than, you know, uh, rather than just pushing electrons into a grid, um, is it solving for X? So, you know, a lot of work around, you know, the, the power to X factor, uh, hydrogen storage, uh, other uses as we, you know, as we push to electrify our economy um, and decarbonize our economy. And I think we also have to break down some, as I say here, break down some of the barriers uh, on the sale of power. Um, in Canada, we have a very, you know, what we sometimes call a very fortress model uh, for power, where each province is kind of master of its own destiny um, around self-sufficiency and, and whatnot. Um, and it's all, uh, in many places, it's a monopolistic market where there's only one buyer of power. And so breaking down some of those barriers to, to be a bit more creative in terms of what the offtake is um, and what the end use of, of some of the power that's generated offshore um, will help to drive, help to drive demand um, and, and tap into some of the excellent resources that we have around, uh, you know, uh, across our coasts. The other thing is, is, is real, realistic expectation on supply chain. And I think, you know, the, um, again, as, as, as marine renewables have, have, have talked about earlier and, and what the work they're doing, I think we, you know, it's, it's, it's not re it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not about protectionist you know policy around local content uh, and and local manufacturing. It's looking at what what capabilities are in the market and how you leverage those to to uh, again drive you know, drive low cost, uh, drive competitiveness, and drive opportunity that's sustainable rather than a blip. And I think. You know, in, in many markets around the world, we see, uh, you know, we see everyone wanting to reinvent the wheel. I think what we're doing here in Canada, um, you know, the, the dialogue with the government, the dialogue with the industry is one that we're encouraged by. I think there's a wealth of experience, uh, you know, marine experience and maritime experience in the country. And uh, as long as we can push that, that all kind of dovetails into, you know, a, a pretty interesting opportunity um, longer term. I mean, we know this is a, you know, the offshore wind isn't going to happen necessarily next week or next year in Canada, but, you know, by the mid to late 2020s when demand starts to change and some of these barriers break down, um, I think we'll see a much, uh, you know, a, a great opportunity and we're quite excited you know, as one of those, the, the, the few Canadian players uh, on the international stage that wants to repatriate some of that and bring some of that talent home um, and, and help governments, help society achieve the goals that they want to see here, here in the country. So that's, that's a, just a snapshot in terms of how we're approaching, uh, how we've approached our, you know, our, our inclusion and, and, and opportunity in the international sector and where we think we can bring some of that back to Canada um to uh to, to 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 benefit you know multiple players and multiple goals so with that um happy to take questions and and happy to uh uh you know see where this goes thank you thank you very much david for your very interesting presentation about the overview of northern power on canadian offshore wind market uh, well now it's uh, time to uh, place some questions and discuss some topics. I know the timing is running and everybody is uh, looking forward to have lunch. Uh, we have actually uh, some very interesting questions, so I would ask all of the speakers to turn on the cameras if possible. Um, and Jeanette, please uh, correct me, but if we may we have 10 minutes more to place questions? Ricardo. Um, if you could go with five minutes would be great because otherwise uh, we don't have time for a break, but uh, okay. you can manage. Okay, thank you very much. I'll do my, my best. Of course, some of the questions will not be placed and I apologize in advance for this. Uh, time is running. Well, I have uh, here one, uh, one question. Uh, and we can start by David because he was the last one speaking. So we start by the end. Uh, from Antonio Sarmento to, to David from Northern Power, what are the major challenges that Northern Power faces in developing uh, offshore wind? And how much does it differ between the Canadian, European, and Asian markets? Uh, the challenges are, I mean, 
it's it's a very competitive space. I mean, very quickly, offshore wind has become you know got moved from a from a uh, somewhat of a niche uh, market to to mainstream, and today one of the most competitive um, you know sources of new jet, new new power um, uh, you know around the world. Um, but it is a it is it is a very uh, competitive space where you know a lot of players have come in and and you have government you know as the market matures you know government policy is changing around you know uh, governments you know we're moving from kind of large government support to more kind of uh, uh, you know where today we're seeing zero dollar zero dollar in some places proposed negative you know negative bid pricing. Um, so I think that's that's a challenge for for many of us as we need to shake up some of our uh, historic uh, approaches to this and business models around this and get smarter around alternative offtakes. Um, as I said earlier, you know, solving the kind of power of X factor. What's the end use of our of, of our uh, electrons? Um, and and you know, just keeping up with that. And then there's also you know the the the, the challenge around you know where you know we've heard a lot about floating today where's float you know what's the what's the, the pickup and maturity of of floating over the number or, you know next few years because um you know similar to onshore renewables where you know you start to run you start to get crowding um in some markets you know whether it's japan or or, or korea floating is you know we're going to leapfrog to floating very quickly um and uh you know technology and cost need to, to keep up with that so that's uh, you know some of the challenges and apologies the, the last the, the second part of that question. I think was it's, it's, it's basically the, the difference that you face between the different markets. It I mean it it it, it really is all of that. I mean it, the, the, it's it's it, you know each market is is maturing. I think there's also a there, there's also a, markets need to be patient if they don't try to uh, mature too quickly. You know where you know uh, Asia is looking to Europe and seeing some of the you know the cost on on um, uh, cost coming down very rapidly, but that took you know it's dropped very rapidly over the last couple of years, but that took ten years of stable policy, stable tariffs to get to that much uh, to help the industry mature. You need to allow the market to mature, and you can't necessarily push that that too quickly. Um, because it will impact the speed, the rate, and the and and the number of competitors you have in the market. Thank you, uh, David, for your clear uh, explanation. Uh, now I have uh, well one one question actually to um, from Ricardo Rocha to uh, Elisa. Um, if uh, a global company would like to evaluate the development of offshore wind uh, greenfield projects in Canada, where it should it start? Basically, uh, are there already areas defined for offshore wind development? And if so, how are the development rights granted based on the current legislation? Can you elaborate briefly, Elisa, because you have no much time on that, please? Yeah, I'll provide a quick answer. I would say, I mean, honestly, right now, I don't think the Canadian market is necessarily at the point where it's an easy process for a company to move through, mainly because some of the legislation and regulations that I mentioned are really un still under development. Um, and so there's not a clear pathway uh, at the moment. I mean, I think the, the option for developers right now are, you know, pilot uh, demonstration kind of projects that don't require the land leases and interconnections that are required. But then, of course, you get to the, you know, the question of economies of scale and whether that's really economic for a company at this point. Um, where we're seeing some innovation and, you know, some creative thinking around this with developers is, is generally around that, that kind of thing. Demonstration, um, partnering with other industries. So I'll just give one example. Um, in Newfoundland, you know, there is a lot of talk about uh, using offshore wind to um, power offshore oil and gas platforms. And that's obviously something we see in Europe. Um, so those are kind of the early things. It's, I don't think Canada is ready at this point, um, you know, for a large scale offshore shore wind, but that's definitely something that we're working, you know, towards in the future. And we do see potential for that, especially as electrification and things like um, green hydrogen become, you know, larger, uh, a larger focus for, for our country. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, would be more fixed or floating foundations, in your opinion, in Canada? Is, is there already any 
method of the current the local market? Elisa. Sorry, do you mind just repeating the, the first part of that? I, it just went out a little bit. I couldn't hear. If it's uh, uh, if we move, we will move more on the floating foundations or fixed bottom foundations, in your opinion? Um, I think I mean just considering like depth and and what I know of that around Atlantic coast, I think floating will be a focus. Um, I, I mean, and there's obviously areas for for fixed as well. Um, one of the challenges we see, particularly like in the Newfoundland area, are is ice and icebergs, and so there's a lot of um, you know technology, I think, innovation that would have to go in around that. But obviously, there's experience around the world that could help inform that. Thank you. Well, uh, I have much more questions to mainly all of the speakers, to da Damian, to José Pinheiro, to Alex, to a Amorina, to, to Manuel, but unfortunately I have no choice unless to uh, end up this, uh, this session. Uh, appreciate uh, your time, uh, your shares, and uh, I ask everyone that was not able to have the answer by the speakers, well, to contact them directly, and I'm sure networking will uh, keep moving on appreciate your, your time ladies and gentlemen and uh, thank you thank you very much again thank you thank you bye thank you so uh thank you ricardo uh thank you all